We yeah. all we all program, but how many of us know about transistors and assembly language mm -hmm. and compilers? But we don't need to, right? Yep. Because we can just program and everything is optimized for us under the hood. Intelligence is the hottest new thing in technology right now, but my next guest says there's something else we should be paying attention to. Quantum computing. How are you doing? I'm very good, I'm very good. Awesome, so let's introduce yourself. What do you do? I'm Yuval, uh, I'm the head of research at Q-Control and we are developing all the tools that eventually go to our product. Yeah, so how did Q-Control start and what's kind of the overarching goal of the company? So Q-Control is a six years old company. At the beginning, it started as developing tools to help researchers optimize and make devices better and with time as we grew, uh, we offer now different products for very different end users, mm -hmm. all the way from newcomers to quantum, people who just want to learn and educate themselves, to experts that want to optimize their devices, and all the way to uh, programmers and people that just want to program and send circuits to devices but are not experts in the quantum hardware, mm -hmm. exactly like classical computers. We, yep. all, we all program, but how many of us? know about transistors and assembly language mm -hmm. and compilers, but we don't need to, right? Yep. Because we can just program and everything is optimized for us under the hood. Yep. So we have tools for these people as well. I actually remember, I think my team was one of the earliest users of Fire Opal actually back in yeah. the day. And error correction is really interesting in the quantum space because in classical error correction, I mean, this is gonna be completely oversimplified, right? But you can just copy bits and you can say yep. like, you know, two of these match and this one doesn't, so the, the two is probably the correct one. Yep. We, could do that. we can't do that in quantum because of the no cloning theorem. Yep. So you can't exactly copy a quantum state. So that means error correction is a lot harder to do. And now, you know, as we've seen in the growth of hardware, I've been in the space for almost 15 years, not in quantum computing, I was in neutral atom quantum memories. We can continue building up qubits, but they're fragile, right? So we need to error correct to actually get to a place where we can run real algorithms, yes, right? Absolutely. So yeah, so I remember back in the day, the really cool device, you, you all also pioneered this method to actually visualize a two qubit system, the entanglement there. Um, so what's new in Fire Opal? So Fire Opal and in general, like Pipeline is now available on IBM mm -hmm. devices. Um, it's completely frictionless. So if you know how to run circuits on IBM device, it will be exactly the same. You just need to choose Q-Control and that's it. Everything else will be exactly the same. Same code, mm -hmm. cost is not going to cost you more. And the results that you are going to see are much similar to what you would expect to see if the computer was perfect. Really? Exactly. We're not making the computers perfect, but we're making them much closer to being perfect. And it's all in software. Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of optimizations in the back. Mm -hmm. For you as a user, it's one to one. There is no overhead. It's all real time. You won't even know that you are using your control besides clicking the button for Q-Control and you'll just see better performance. Interesting. So what are some of those optimizations? So it's a full pipeline. So we start with compilation. We mm -hmm. take the circuit and we make sure that it is compiled on the device that you want to run in an optimal way with the minimal number of gates, with the best gates possible. Then we choose layout, which qubits are going to run your circuits on this big device. Then we optimize the gates, the, ga the, the way that the gates are defined, uh, C not X gates, they define the on superconducting qubits as microwaves, on other ions as mm -hmm. lasers. We really change the pole shape in order to make them better gates. Mm -hmm. um, we add techniques like dynamical decoupling. We uh, do measurement error mitigation to account for uh, errors in the measurement. We are doing a lot of things and all this in harmony eventually gives you much, much better results. Interesting. Yeah. So what are you excited about for 2024? Oh, so I think that we can start talking about utility. And I'm, I'm careful, I'm not saying quantum advantage. I think that quantum advantage is a bit far away, mm -hmm. but utility, starting to solve problems that are not trivial. Until mm -hmm. a year ago, I could solve problems that are trivial on my laptop. I yep. could take like 10 minutes to code that, my laptop wouldn't even sweat, mm -hmm. just solve it easily. Mm -hmm. I think now we are at the point that we can solve problems on IBM devices that I cannot solve on my laptop. Oh, I'm not okay. saying that we cannot the classical computers cannot solve right. them, but I cannot solve them on my laptop. So mm -hmm. that's already one step ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think that with this progress, mm -hmm. in a few years, maybe not even that many, we'll be able to solve some set of problems that classical computers cannot solve. We demonstrated on IBM uh, a QAOA implementation of 80 qubits solving a graph problem, a MaxCat problem mm -hmm. on a non-generic graph, not something that is tuned for the IBM mm -hmm. devices, a completely generic graph. 
and we solved it correctly using a QA way that ran on the device without simulation, without cheating, without using classical optimizer. From zero knowledge on the quantum device, we solved this 80, cube, uh, 80 nodes graph mm -hmm. problem. So that's a non-trivial problem to solve. So when you're looking at the results, like you mentioned, we have like really good performance. What are you actually looking for? So of course, ideally, we want that the results that we get from the device are what we expect, a perfect device, mm -hmm. a perfect device with no T1, mm -hmm. with no gate error, with no errors. Mm -hmm. gate of course, we know that we, we, can't, we cannot get there. Mm -hmm. There are some errors that error suppression alone cannot correct, and we must use error correction mm -hmm. for that. Absolutely. But we want to make sure that we bring the device to this point that the only limiting factor are these only few errors that we cannot really correct, and then we can use error correction on top mm -hmm. of that to correct them. Mm -hmm. Using error correction while all these other errors exist there is equivalent of turning an air conditioner where all the uh, windows and doors mm -hmm. are open. You just work very hard to fix things that you don't need to. Once you cancel or suppress all the errors that you can suppress using software, using better design, using better gates, then the last mile should be error correction. And the overhead that you'll pay in this case will be much, much lower than if you'll try to do it right now without error suppression at all. So then also you all have an educational product called Black Opal. Sure. So I did a video about that recently, actually, and went through some of the fun features. And it's funny you talked about graphs, right? Because traveling salesman yep. was a big one there. And uh, that was one of my comments as well, where I was like, well, this looks really trivial with seven cities, right? You exactly. kind of figured that out. But it has a lot of really cool visual features. I've noticed it's really great for people who really want to learn about quantum but not get overwhelmed by the math. What's the, the approach you all are doing with Black yep. Opal? Yeah. So we, we notice that even when we talk with technical people, but mm -hmm. outside of the quantum mm -hmm. world, they understand that, that there are problems of interest that they care about, that they can use quantum computers to solve. But the barrier to even start thinking about it is just too high. Yeah. How do they familiarize themselves? So sure, they can go and do some quantum course or read some quantum book, but that's very hard for people that right. are not from a physics background. And some of them are technical people from computer science, from engineering, but just no quantum background. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt the need in having an educational tool, which is maybe a bit less formal. Mm -hmm. You don't need to sit now and watch a you know, 10 hours course with heavy right. mathematics. You can just use it whenever you have time. So it's a very interactive, uh, very easy to use tool with over 400 lessons. Uh, if you have five minutes, you can use your phone and just learn about one specific small topic. Yep. And it really from the from the very beginning of what is a wave and what is a superposition and all the way to how to write a small circuit, how to program a small circuit mm -hmm. on an IBM device or custom, uh, uh, how mm -hmm. to write a custom file. So yeah, it's just a great way to introduce yourself to this concept and hopefully it will lower the barrier for people outside right. of the quantum world. and. That's what you want. You really want to bring people outside to our world because if it will just stay our bubble and we'll just talk with other vendors and other people from the quantum computing, that's not the way to grow. Right. Yeah, Mike called it the Duolingo yeah. of uh, exactly. quantum computing. Exactly. That's You can go through these lessons. Yes. They're pretty short and uh, accessible. To your point, I think one of the big things that we're seeing, right, is we're in the era of punch cards with the computers, but we're actually building up these higher level systems earlier on. Yeah. And one of the things is like, as physicists, you know, we don't have the domain expertise in all these other applications. Yes, we have some ideas. We have the ideas on pharmaceuticals. We have the ideas on financial applications, but there's probably so much else out there and we have to teach those domain experts how to use these computers. Exactly, exactly. We need, we need, if we need to learn something from how classical computers evolve mm -hmm. is the community, the fact that everyone can use them. Mm -hmm. That's why we have applications because people bring their expertise and just using these tools to enable solutions and as you said we are we are some of us are physicists we don't we don't really know how to do these things but part of what we are trying to do you control is to use people with a lot of experience from product and from user experience to try and lower the boundaries and lower the friction for people to start using these machines mm -hmm. um, and eventually as a community we'll need to introduce more abstraction mm -hmm. people don't like to think about quantum circuits mm -hmm. that's like assembly language for, right. for computers that's hard yeah we must abstract that. We must make it much more accessible for people mm -hmm. that are amazing programmers. You still need to know how to program. When you right. program, what you learn. You learn algorithms. You learn how to program. You learn how to build an algorithm. People will still need to know that. Mm -hmm. 
but you don't need to be a quantum expert in order to do that. Maybe mm -hmm. it will be a course in computer science, how to do quantum algorithms right. at one point. But that's it. Beside that, it will just be the same level of abstraction that we have. Um, it will be like, I want to know Python, I want to know C++, I want mm -hmm. to know Java, I want to know how to code, how to program a quantum mm -hmm. computer. It will be another course. Right. So right now you all are integrated with the IBM. Are there any plans that you, you can tell me about uh, or integrating with other hardware systems? So soon, for sure. Okay. Uh, we are working with m many other providers. We really don't want to choose. We want to be on all platforms. And does this apply to different types of hardware modalities or is it really focused on superconducting? Other modalities, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, for the user, it will be completely agnostic. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the back, we adjust our tool and, tools and make sure that it will be for ions or for atoms or for right. photons or for superconducting qubits or for the different modalities of superconducting qubits. So we do a lot of work in the back, but eventually for the user, it will be completely agnostic. You mm -hmm. just give us the input circuit or algorithm and we'll just run it and make sure that it will be as close as possible to a noiseless computer. Right. And then also Q-Control has gotten into quantum sensing sure. in the last year or two, I think. Even a bit more, but yes. Well, a bit more yes. from the outside world. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing there? So in some sense, we are using the same IDs that we implement in, in quantum computing to sensors. So quantum sensors is not a new thing. We know that we can use the rules of quantum mechanics. We can use atoms and ions in order to measure, mm -hmm. to measure magnetic field, to measure acceleration, to very, very, very high accuracy. The main problem is that most of these uh, uh, devices, they work perfectly in the lab, mm -hmm. where everything is shielded and there are no noises. But if you have a device now that you want to put on a vessel, on an airplane or a boat, mm -hmm. that's not a lab. Mm -hmm. And when you put these devices in these environments, they just don't work. Mm -hmm. And we use our software to integrate that with these tools and make them work at the same performance that you can get from them in the lab when you put them on airplanes, when you put them on boats. And these things are very relevant to many industries from defense, uh, communication, mm -hmm. transportation. So 